to trigger or not to trigger? That is the question. I'm Dr. Mark Amol, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. A trigger shot. We've all heard it. But what does it mean? Why is it important? Today, we talk about the trigger shot and when to do the trigger shot and when you don't need the trigger shot. When you hear the term trigger, what they are talking about is the trigger injection. A trigger shot is what would make you ovulate. Now, the actual hormone in your body that makes you ovulate is a hormone called LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone does not last very long. And for that reason, because your body breaks it down so fast, we use HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, which is the same hormone released from the trophoblastic cells, which are the placenta cells when you're pregnant. The reason HCG works is because it's so similar to LH molecularly that it will trigger the same receptors and make you ovulate. Now, the purpose of a trigger shot is to make you ovulate at a specific time. I think it's really important to understand that a trigger shot does not make you more pregnant. So I have people all the time who come to me from other clinics or from their OB and tell me that they really weren't doing any shots with their timed intercourse cycles because the doctor was just giving them Clomid and told them to have intercourse every other day starting on day 10. And they're worried that they're not going to get pregnant because they didn't take this trigger shot. And that is not true. The trigger shot only makes you ovulate at a specific time. So I always tell people, if you're going to do timed intercourse, just have timed intercourse. Don't pay money for a trigger shot. The only purpose to take that trigger shot is if you just don't want to have intercourse. So technically, if you don't want to have intercourse and only want to have it once, you could tell your husband that you have to take a trigger shot. But if you don't mind having intercourse and you don't want to spend an extra hundred bucks, you can just let your body do it naturally which will occur because as the follicles get larger, your body will make more estrogen. And as you make more estrogen, that will eventually trigger the body to release LH hormone, which will then make you ovulate. You don't ovulate more eggs because you take a trigger shot. If you have three eggs growing on Clomid, you'll release all three eggs. The trigger shot does not make you more pregnant. It just makes it so you know the exact timing of when you're going to ovulate. There is one exception where HCG is not used, and that is in IVF. In IVF, sometimes we'll use what's called a Lupron trigger shot. Now, a Lupron trigger shot is from the hormone group gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and that is the hormone that then makes you release FSH and LH. The purpose of a Lupron trigger in IVF is you're trying to get the body to release its own LH supply to make you ovulate. And the benefit of that is because HCG has a very long half-life. And so when you use HCG in IVF, it could increase the risk of someone having ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. And so in the right conditions, we will use Lupron instead of HCG if we think there's a concern of the patient going into ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So what's the importance of a trigger injection? I mean, is it just for timing or is there actually another purpose? Well, from a fertility perspective for the patient, it's a timing issue. But from a medical perspective, the HCG trigger or LH trigger causes the egg to undergo the last stage of meiosis. If you take a step back to your childhood, you probably remember learning about 
mitosis. And mitosis is when cells divide to make two. But there was another process you learned, you may not remember it, but it was called meiosis. And in meiosis, it's like mitosis, but the goal is different. You're not trying to make a complete duplicate. You're actually trying to decrease the number of chromosomes in half. Women are born with all their eggs, even before they were born. And all the eggs are stuck in the first phase of meiosis, specifically prophase. What the trigger shot does is it restarts the meiosis process and the eggs then go to the metaphase of meiosis too. And at that point, that's when the egg can be fertilized by the sperm, which are already through the full stages of meiosis. If the eggs don't undergo that process, they have no chance at fertilizing. So without the trigger shot, pulling eggs out of someone would not allow fertilization. But the trigger shot initiates that second stage of meiosis to allow them to fertilize. And that is the medical reason of why you have to ovulate in order to get pregnant. Now, one thing that is important to understand is that the trigger shot itself cannot induce meiosis unless the egg is already at the state which can react to the trigger shot. So for example, if you had three follicles, one at 20, one at 18, and one at 12, the 18 and 20 follicle should undergo the maturation process to then fertilize, which is the meiosis process. But the 12 millimeter follicle is probably not going to be mature. And for that reason, the 8CG trigger will not start meiosis in that egg because the follicle never reached the mature size. So what made me want to do a podcast on triggering other than to start the intro with to trigger and not to trigger, which by the way was fun. The reason I did this is because I get asked all the time, when do you trigger? When going through IVF, patients will get concerned that they're ovulating or want to know, when do I trigger? And it's not an easy answer because there isn't just a specific size of the follicles. As a matter of fact, there's a major difference when triggering for IUIs and when triggering for IVF. Now, as I stated, I do not usually recommend doing trigger shots for timed intercourse unless a couple has a very difficult time having intercourse regularly. However, if they are doing IUIs, I determine when the trigger based off of more than just follicle size. I look at estrogen levels and other factors that we'll get into. In IVF, we have the benefit of using a medication that prevents ovulation. And for that reason, the reasons we have to trigger early in IUIs is not there for IVF. And we'll touch any of these now. How do I determine when to trigger? There are a lot of factors I look at. I look at the age of the patient. I look at how long they've been trying to get pregnant for. I look at things like the size of the follicle. I look at estrogen levels. I look at the shape of the follicles. I also look at things like, why are we doing this? Are we needing a lot of eggs? Are we needing less eggs? I look at the spread of the follicles. So let's look at a very specific situation, intrauterine inseminations, IUIs. Most of the time when fertility doctors are doing IUIs, they are not using antagonists such as cetratide or relics. Those are medications that prevent ovulation. And because of this, we have to be careful that we wait too long it is possible that you will ovulate, defeating the whole purpose of IUIs because once you ovulate, the egg is only good for about 24 hours. This is extremely important in situations where you're using donor sperm or where the couple is not having regular intercourse because if you ovulate before I anticipate it, 
then the sperm will not be at the right time when you are ovulating. Now, when you're looking at the size of the follicle, it's true that most follicles will not ovulate until at least 20 millimeters to 22 millimeters. However, I mentioned earlier that it's not the size of the follicle that makes you ovulate. It is the estrogen level that goes up that initiates the process to release LH to make you ovulate. Which means if you only have one follicle growing, you can let that follicle easily get to 20 millimeters without any concerns of ovulation because it's just one follicle. And one follicle at maturity makes about 200 picograms per deciliter of estrogen. But when you're making more than one follicle, the estrogen level is going to rise sooner. For example, if you had three or four follicles growing, you may want to trigger when the first follicle gets to 18 millimeters because the estrogen level is going to go up sooner and that is going to make you ovulate. Now, if you're younger, I may be okay with allowing two follicles to make it to 18 or 20 because I don't need a lot of follicles to get you pregnant. But if you're someone who has a long history of infertility or who is older, I may need more eggs. And so even if the follicles are spreading and now you have a 13, a 14, a 16, and 18, I want to get one more day. Now, in that situation, I draw an estrogen level. And the reason I draw an estrogen level is because size isn't the question. The question is, what's the estrogen level? If I find that estrogen level is under 200 picograms per deciliter, I know I might be able to buy another day. If it's higher than that, I know I'm going to need to block the estrogen so you don't ovulate. And in that situation, I will then use an antagonist such as Ganarelix or a medicine called Cetratide. Those medications will block the brain from sending the signal to release LH that would then make you ovulate. That allows me to buy a f- another day so I can allow more follicles to get bigger to improve your chances of getting pregnant. Where I see a lot of clinics make mistakes, especially with donor sperm, is they allow the follicles to get too large or they don't open up on the weekend to find out how big those follicles are getting. And if that estrogen level goes up, they won't know that they're ovulating and will miss that window. Not all clinics check estrogen levels. However, the ones who do are going to have a better idea if you're near ovulation so they can make the best prediction for you. So in summary, how do I know when to trigger someone with IUI? I don't have a specific size, but I use all those parameters, try to get the most eggs between 15 and about 20 millimeters, unless there's multiple eggs. And then at that point, I use my estrogen level to help determine when to trigger or when to add another medication to prevent early ovulation. Some studies have shown that approximately 15 to 25% of IUI cycles have premature ovulation. So it's something to be concerned about if your doctor is not doing all these steps to prevent premature ovulation. So what about IVF? I mean, can't we let the eggs get bigger and bigger and bigger because now we don't have to worry about ovulation? Well, sort of. It is true that you can go further with a follicular size in IVF, but the problem isn't now ovulation. The problem is a thing called post-maturity. In IUI, since we're not preventing ovulation, the follicles, if they get too big, will just ovulate. So you don't have to worry about post-maturation. But in IVF, the methods we use block ovulation. And in those situations, you can get a thing called post-maturation. This is where the follicle gets too large. And although the egg looks good under the microscope, There is fragmentation and DNA. There are things that occur to that egg that make it poor quality and lower your chances for success. So in IVF, we tend not to allow the follicles to get over 20 millimeters. Matter of fact, most people will trigger at around 18 millimeters with the rest of the follicles being greater than 15. Now, as you can imagine, this is not an easy feat. You have multiple follicles growing Trying to get them all to line up between 15 and 20 millimeters is very difficult. And that is one of the reasons why people are put on birth control. Birth control 
allows the follicles to all go to about the same size, kind of lining up at the starting line of a race. By having all of the follicles starting at the same size, there's less chance of those follicles spreading too much and having more in that perfect zone between 15 and 20 millimeters. Now, I don't pick a time to trigger. I let the patient's body tell me when to trigger. If you're only making two eggs and both of those follicles make it to 18 millimeters, I'll trigger you then. Because at that point, what am I waiting for? But let's say there's nine eggs and four of them are above 15 millimeters with two of them at 18, but there's five of them between 13 and 15. In that situation, I'm going to wait another day because if I wait one more day, I can pick up potentially five more eggs by allowing them to get to that mature zone. Whereas the person only has a couple eggs, I don't need to let them to get to 20 millimeters and take that risk of maybe post-maturation because the eggs are already ready. And sometimes we have to play this gamble. I've even let patients go to 22 millimeters and I tell them, listen, I'm going to let this one egg get bigger because I would rather lose this egg and gain four than to just dismiss those other four eggs that are at 13, 14 millimeters. On the same token, if there's only one egg I'm going to gain and could potentially lose one egg, the net gain is zero and it doesn't make sense to do that. Does this mean then that every follicle that's between 15 and 20 millimeters will be mature and will undergo the meiosis process for fertilization? No. Matter of fact, I would say if they're below 12 millimeters, the chances are probably less than 5% that they're going to be mature. Between about 12 and 14, it's about 50%. Between 14 and 20, it's probably 90% are going to be mature. But there are times that I've had patients who I've triggered when their follicles are 18 millimeters and they come back immature. I've had people who've had a couple of follicles in the 12 millimeter range and they come back mature. So none of it is a perfect science. Now, just like with IUIs, we use lots of parameters here. So for example, yes, I may get someone who has 12 follicles in that 15 to 20 millimeter range and I'm ready to trigger them. Their estrogen levels look good but I don't trigger them that day. I might wait one more day. Now, why would I do that in that patient? Well, they could have a history of poor maturation. So there are some people who don't follow the rules. Their body didn't read the book on infertility. So for them, I'm going to wait an extra day because I know last time when they triggered at their prior clinic, they weren't mature at those sizes. So I give them an extra day. Now, there are other situations like this last IVF cycle we did where I had two patients whose estrogen levels just wouldn't go up and their follicles were ready, absolutely ready, but their estrogen levels were too low. I want to see at least 100 to 200 picograms per deciliter of estrogen for every, every follicle I'm expecting to be mature. And when it's not, I'm going to wait another day. Now, there's a point to how long you can wait because we talked about post-maturation. So if I'm on that brink between 18 and 20, I may say, okay, I'll let them get to 20 in this situation, because the estrogen says they're not right. And I was correct this last time. A patient's estrogen level was low. I said to her, listen, I'm going to wait another day. I know I said I was going to trigger you today based off a of size, but I'm concerned. And it was the right decision. The next day we had more mature eggs and it was seen when we did the retrieval. So as you see, it's not just a question of size. It's not just a question of estrogen. Sometimes things such as what the patient is going through to get here matters. If they've had a history of poor maturation, you may wait longer. Another situation is why we're doing IVF. There are some people who need lots and lots of eggs. For example, people who have a history of poor fertilization due to male factor or if someone is looking for maybe a very specific gender, I may wait an extra day to have more mature eggs. Why would I need to wait an extra day just because of a sperm issue? Well, this has to come down to ICSI. When using ICSI, we know we can only fertilize mature eggs. With immature eggs, 
You can put sperm with them and sit all night long and they can fertilize, but not with ICSI. With ICSI, you have to have mature eggs. So the problem is in the patient who's going to do standard insemination, I don't have to worry if some of the eggs are immature because I know the sperm can sit with them overnight and can fertilize them. But the patient who has male factor infertility, I need to make sure we have the maximum amount mature at the time of ICSI or they aren't going to fertilize because you can fertilize immature eggs, but they rarely will fertilize. But sitting in a Petri dish, that party can go all night long and they can end up fertilizing in the morning. So as you can see, it's not a simple decision. So when people ask me, what number are you waiting to the trigger? I explain to them, I wish it was that easy. I would be able to go home a lot earlier and let someone else make that decision. But unfortunately, it's not as easy as a decision as that sounds. There's a lot of things that come into play. Many times, if I've had someone who's gone through before, I'll even go back and look at their prior cycles when I trigger them, what size, and compare it to that. Because all these little things matter. Because sure, one egg might not matter, but they also might matter. And so that decision becomes a very important decision that I don't just base off of a single number, a single size, or just the person. I take the whole situation, just like all doctors do, and make the best decision for you. One of the reasons I did this discussion was almost every cycle, I get several patients telling me, Dr. Amos, I'm ovulating. I know I'm ovulating. And they're not. There's no way they can ovulate. We're giving them medications to prevent ovulation. But why do they feel like they're ovulating? I mean, every symptom they have is absolutely correct for ovulation. And the reason for that is, is that the symptoms for ovulation aren't ovulation. What do I mean by that? Well, the symptoms you're feeling in ovulation are due to estrogen levels. So we all know now, we've talked about that at 18 to 20 millimeters, the follicle will be close to maturity and it's going to make a high estrogen level around 200 picograms per deciliter. And that estrogen level at that time will cause certain symptoms. Those symptoms are going to be cervical mucus will increase. When we'll say, you know, I know this, my cervical mucus is changing. The other thing that will happen is high estrogen levels cause the vagina to process estrogen, which will then increase leucorrhea, which is the term that describes the white discharge that most women will notice around the time of ovulation. So it's not that they're feeling ovulation. It's that they're noticing the symptoms associated with ovulation, but those symptoms aren't actually associated with ovulation. They're associated with estrogen levels. So in IVF or in IUIs, because we're making more follicles, they're going to notice those symptoms earlier. Now, more so in IVF, because with IUIs, we talked about we're going to trigger as we get close to ovulation. So we don't go past that too far. But in IVF, by day five, by day six, our estrogen levels are well above that of ovulation. So by then, they're starting to feel those symptoms. They notice the white discharge and they get worried that they're ovulating. Again, I say this is an association, not causation. Just like when you look outside and you see everyone umbrellas, the umbrellas didn't cause the rain. People are just using umbrellas because of the rain. Association versus causation. And this week in the mailbag. This question comes from Jessica and wanted to know, as we discussed in our podcast, what if embryos don't make it to day five? And what can you do about it? So Jessica, I think the important part here I was talking about is when to decide when to keep doing IVF. And I think there's a little bit more to this question than just how do you improve it? So I'm going to break this up into a couple parts. The first part is what can you do to help embryos go from day three to day five? Probably the best thing you can do is to have a good lab. I've mentioned it before. Every lab is going to look good when you're 25 years old going through IVF. Only the labs that are really good are you going to notice that they're really good when you have few fertilized 
or when you have people who are older and you can see how many embryos can make it to the end then. In general, we want about 50% of the embryos that are made to make it the blastocyst. It doesn't mean those embryos are going to be good, and that's an important distinction. You can still have a good lab and make half the embryos to blastocyst and not biopsy them or not transfer them because those blasts are just too poor quality. That's not the same thing as embryos not making it to day five. So if your embryos on day three stall, that means something different than embryos that make it to day five that are poor quality. Now, the thing you can do to help it is you can use things like growth hormone. That can help the embryos fix small problems in the sperm and small little DNA issues. You can also use the Zymot chip, which is a way to filter the sperm and to remove sperm with large amounts of DNA fragmentation. Other vitamins like CoQ10 and DHEA can be used, as well as overall health, not smoking, making sure you're taking vitamin D, making sure that your thyroid is normal. Those are all things that can help. The important thing to remember, though, is why would an embryo not make it from day three to day five? And we touched on this in the previous podcast that nothing's really happening on day three. So it's not hard for embryos to make it to day three, but to get to day five, you have to have a normal DNA set. And if they're abnormal, they're not going to make it. So someone who's 44, I'm not going to be shocked seeing embryos not make it from day three to day five because they probably have a lot more genetic abnormalities. But if you're younger and they're not making it, then I'm more concerned about the environment, whether it's endometriosis whether it's inflammation in their body, something might be affecting those embryos. And if not in a good lab, those embryos could be stalling because the inflammation, the stress on those embryos are even being amplified because the lab isn't as good. When you're making decisions to determine if you want to do IVF again, the thing you have to ask is, how many embryos did I even start with? So, If you start with only two embryos and none make it to the end, that could just be chance. If both of those embryos were abnormal, it makes sense they didn't make it to the end. Now, in good labs, if you're young, at least one should make it. But again, that's not a rule. But if you start with 12 embryos and none of them make it to day five, then you're looking for something that's causing them not to make it there, either genetic You're looking at things like inflammation. You're looking at things like DNA fragmentation. And so at that point, you need to start looking for other issues, looking for things like if there's a sperm issue that we're not realizing, is there's an inflammation issue, such as people with PCOS or patients with endometriosis, or even just being more mature can increase your inflammation. Illness can increase your inflammation. Growth hormone can help there, but the important thing to remember about growth hormone is it can only help the embryos that aren't abnormal. So if 50% of the embryos are abnormal, you can take all the growth hormone you want in the world. It can't fix those. They're already abnormal. So as you get older, you find that growth hormone, CoQ10, DHEA, all those things are going to have less benefit because there's less embryos to help. But when you're younger, such as when you're under 35, most of your embryos are normal. So those little things start to make a bigger difference. But it's important to keep it all in the context that some of these things aren't going to make half your embryos better. It might make a couple. And, And that's the most important thing to always remember when you're going through IVF. The expectation for IVF is not who makes the most embryos. The expectation in IVF is not who got the most eggs. The goal is to have a baby. Yes, is it disappointing that you don't always get a lot of embryos? Is it disappointing that you got less eggs than everyone else? It is. But if you come away pregnant, that is the purpose. And so all these little things you're doing are trying to get you one step closer to getting that one embryo and to get you pregnant. Thank you, Jessica, for that great question. I want to thank everyone again for your continued support. If you like us, please review us. Your reviews allow us to get known 
and allow more people to learn more about their fertility. I look forward to talking to you guys again next week. Until then, this is Taco Bell Fertility Tuesdays. Have a great week.